glad that you were able to join us today, especially today. I don't even want to waste a lot of breath on the intro because I want to leave this all on the mats, leave it all up to the man himself. Uh, it's pretty rare that I get to speak to an actual living legend. Um, where to start? This gentleman you might know from a CBC comedy special, Thick and Thin, from his various acting roles, probably because of his Nubian comedy review, the Nubian Disciples of Richard Pryor going on pff, over 25 years now. Um, I just know him as the godfather of Canadian comedy, the one, the only, Kenny Robinson. Welcome, maestro. It's lovely to be here. Uh, and you're just, you're killing me with that whole, uh, what was that uh, Jane Fonda movie, ba uh, Barbarella? You got that whole sexy outer space vixen thing happening. And I literally planned this the okay. night before because I knew you were coming. Okay, so that's, that's super, it works. <laughs> this is all for you, Kenny, all for you. You know, we, you and I, actually, I should start by saying, uh, by the way, welcome to Carla Collins Rocks the Elmo. That's how excited I am to have you. I didn't even give the damn name of the show, but you and I shared this very stage, the brief moment well, that Toronto, was, Ontario, was, Canada was open. It was your stage. I was just, uh, you just blessed me enough to, uh, to share it with you, but it was a great evening, and uh, especially when everybody else was doing shows, not to put them down, but everybody else was doing shows in parks and garages, and, and uh, I said, thank God Carla's bringing back real showbiz, everything <laughs> from the sequence to, you know, the to just uh, the legendary uh, palace of entertainment that you're able to uh, to put it on. And so that it, it says a lot about you. It says more about you than it says about our industry, I think. Wow, that's so much to take in that I just need a moment almost. But, <laughs> you know, listen, God bless. We're all pivoting and bending and doing what we can, but a drive-in show where people honk instead of laughter, I'm just not secure enough, Kenny. i got to well, be honest. The funny thing about the drive-ins, though, before they started, I was thinking on booking a drive-in theater because um, after World War II, my dad used to put on jazz concerts. Uh, they are fundraisers for uh, the, the guys that came back that were prisoners of... Uh, when Hong Kong fell, they were the Winnipeg Grenadiers and Patricia Pat, uh, CCLI and what have you. So he used to put on ja uh, Sunday afternoon jazz concerts uh, to raise money for, uh, for the returning vets. So I was thinking, well, uh, you're not going to get the drive-in theater on a Saturday night, but you might be able to get it on a Sunday afternoon. And then just a couple of drive-ins I called, never answered. And then uh, it seemed like Just for Laughs jumped on that whole idea. And I wasn't thinking of people honking their horns. I somehow even thought that you could pull out your lawn chairs and sit outside your van. Well, yeah, a, a la Dave Chappelle. That right. works. But the ones in the actual drive-ins, that's what they... I don't know if they're still doing it, but they were honking. Yeah. Of an it just, you know, well, the secret brought me back is to you street honking. You have to own land. So that's why Chappelle could do it. Exactly. <laughs> you got to have a big farm. You know, what What am I going to do with all this vacant... Pr that's, why the, that's why Manitoba and Saskatchewan should become the, the showbiz capitals of Canada once the snow melts. Well, it might, because it's all shifting like anything's up for grabs. We don't know what the other side of this looks like. We have no idea. And the difference between the U.S. and Canada, because uh, Dave Chappelle, to me, is the goat of the yep. U.S. You're the goat of Canada, and yet drive-ins weren't returning your calls. It's... Really motherfucking tough to be a Canadian well, wasn't, entertainer. They weren't even re not returning the calls. There was no answer machine. It just <laughs> rang, just <laughs> rang, just rang. You know, so um, probably somebody wanting to know what show you know, can is it, what what movies are you showing this weekend was probably the most common phone call they were getting at the time. Are so, you playing Porky Six? Could I can, be. I, yeah, I don't think I can remember the time I've just heard a phone ring because without an answering machine, right? Yeah. It's just, and who phones anymore? Everybody's on text. Well, just I, it's like a serial killer. Your phone rings and you're just, oh my God, what, who's dead? Why is my phone ringing? It totally killed the calling up the exes and just letting her say, hello, 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 <laughs> without hanging it up. You know, those, those days are gone. Well, I told you, you know, I, as you know, I have an older gentleman lover and I'll tell you, he's finding it really hard to send dick pics on a rotary phone. Thanks so much, I'm here at the Elmo. <laughs> All week. It's painful. Got his bag caught in, the, in it. <laughs> <laughs> Ow! <laughs> Damn it. No, I really love her. I'm going to try again. Um, so I, I'm, I want to do this entire special on you because I don't know if everybody knows your origin story. I do. I know that you're uh, born in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. you also raised in Chicago. Um, I know how very close... You were with your mother because we have that in common. Yes. I don't know much about your father. You mentioning the jazz is the first I've heard of your dad. Oh, well, my dad, my dad had an incredible start. Um, he was born in New York City, and uh, 
His father was, uh, was a, a bookie, gambler, pimp by the name of Lovey Joe Robinson. Wow. With a name like Lovey Joe, uh, you don't need a business card. You don't, so. and you have very few things, <laughs> areas of expertise you can enter, you I know, think. So anyway, uh, my grandmother was, uh, her health was bad. She was originally from, uh, from, from the uh, Chatham area. So mm -hmm. my grandfather said, well, I don't need a sick woman and I don't need a damn kid and shipped my, uh, my dad and his dying wife uh, up to my, uh, my dad's aunt who lived in Winnipeg. Okay. So he was at that school of, you know, put him on the bus and forget about him. That was the grandfather's uh, The original legacy. tough love. Yeah, you know. So good luck to you, kid. <laughs> um, so, you know, he, so he, you know, so we always had the dual citizenship and what have you, but he, uh, he grew up in a time when, um, you know, he, he was a, a headlining uh, tap dancer on the vaudeville circuit across Canada. and really? uh, I didn't even know there was a vaudeville circuit Yeah, in Canada. you know, and a, and a friend of his, uh, uh, back in those days, brothers did everything you could do for a living. You, some boxed, and then, you know, the one day they're a boxer, the next day they're singing. And, you know, and so he had a friend named Harvey that told me that my father's trademark was he got his knees up higher than anybody else when he was tap dancing. And that I, I've Which been I never a tap lived dancer to see. since I was two and a half, yeah. and that is a huge feat. Well, then he had huge feet. <laughs> but, um, you know, so that was one of the things that he did. And then he had, uh, he had bands that uh, he, would, he would MC and sing, and sometimes he'd play drums. And then when he hooked up with my mom, she would, uh, she would drive the band and uh, collect the cover at the door. And they'd go up to do all these uh, mining towns where uh, they'd do three shows a night and, uh, or their shows where as the shifts were changing over. So they, uh, they, had to, they had to play a little bit of everything. They had to play anything the Mills Brothers was doing. And uh, my mother said, if you're going up to some of these places, you don't bring a fiddle player with you, you're screwed. So they... Uh, <laughs> That's it. They or a banjo. Well, not so much the banjo because it was Manitoba, but they wanted, right. they wanted to hear that fiddle player. So, uh, you know, guys like, uh, you know, Ray Charles and Count Basie was always heard around my house, but so was guys like Eddie Arnold and Hank Williams. So that's why I've got this huge, uh, you know, encyclopedia of, of music that I reach to all the time. But um, so you were you really you were born into a showbiz family. A show, showbiz slash crime, yeah. yeah well, so <laughs> well, it was Canadian showbiz, so it had to be. Well, it had to be to make ends meet. You know, hey, look, the door ain't gonna pay the band, so uh, you know, take a quick walk while I while I while I work out a deal here. So yeah, um, the reason why we even had to leave Winnipeg is my mom used to work for this chicken uh, company or a poultry company, and uh, they didn't have uh, human resources back then. Right. And uh, it was owned by two brothers, and uh, one of them had a habit of um, always trying to rub her shoulders in that creepy guy way, or when she was doing the books, he'd lean over and he'd rest his Johnson against her. Yes, we way before me too, or uh, really any. What oh. year would this be about? Because people well, have to know. 1956. This... Yeah. Yeah, 56. Um, so anyway, every time this guy did this, uh, my mother had her own human uh, human rights commission uh, tribunal, and she'd take money out of the uh, out of the out of their out of their assets. So oh, finally, like they, a feminist Robin Hood. She was uh, steal from the creeps uh, to give to myself. In fact, she got so good at it, she even gave her ex-husband money. Just like here, I feel I felt sorry for him. So I give him a couple hundred here and there. But when um, were your folks married? Uh, they got married on a New Year's Eve, um, nineteen fifty-eight, I believe, and or fifty-seven. And I was born in the January of fifty-eight. So, but my mom was like uh, uh, seven or eight months pregnant with me when she was already in the lockup. So they caught her for embezzlement. What? Yeah. And then they, uh, they hired a new lawyer just out of University of Manitoba Law School named Manny Israel. And um, I, that was basically one of his first cases. And uh, he, um, he let the, this company know, says, well, there's two sets of books, the set that she gave for you guys and the set that she gave Revenue Canada. So if we're going to go to court, you're going to have to show both sets of books. Uh, so they, made a, they cut a deal that if she... Um, that if she made attempts to, uh, to pay some of the money back, that they would drop the beef. Mm -hmm. So after about the second or third payment, my mom goes, I'm never gonna pay these bastards back this money at $45 a, a month, you know? So uh, she said to like my dad- Like a bad student loan. Yeah, so, they, so they, uh, they said, well, let's skip town. So they flipped a coin, uh, head Chicago, tails New York, it came up heads. 
So uh, they uh, they grabbed me and whatever else they could throw into the car and threw me in the back seat. No, no, no kid seats back then. Oh, please, yeah, that's and, for uh, pussies. Um, and, so, and she let wrote me get, bad so checks they were on... all the way from Winnipeg to New York to Montreal to Chicago to back to Detroit. So, you know, <laughs> I was on the road before uh, before I was uh, properly uh, trained. It was in your blood. So you, your early childhood was like in the womb, locked down, and then on the lam? Yeah. So gangster. Well, I don't know, you know, it was just, hey, we're going, you know, when I, when I was older and three years old, four years old, oh, we're going to New York, we're going to go see so-and-so, we're going to go see Uncle, you know, Uncle so-and-so, so it was always, and we always shopped wherever we went, so, you know, going to New York, we stayed at, uh, I wish I could remember the hotels, but uh, I remember getting my shoes, uh, my new, my brand new uh, cowboy boots shined um, in, in one of those big stands where you st where you're above them and your foot right. are in, in the in the in in the in the gynecologist things <laughs> in the stir uh, on the stirrups. So I re that, I remember the cologne I had on burning me. You know, I I, I think I sprayed some on when nobody was looking. I remember my armpits burning that day. So I remember <laughs> things from being like three four years old. And you're wearing cologne. Well, that alone is just well. Uh, the old man wore it, so I want you know, just like daddy. That was uh, you know toddler cologne. I like it. I it feel was, like uh, he didn't know it was toddler's cologne, but when he wasn't <laughs> around, going quack quack. So now, um, so it's an interracial marriage. Yeah, yeah. It's the fifties. Uh, they were, uh, my mother it's was not disowned. a good math equation. My uh, and my mother accused my aunt of being racist, so my aunt said, "Am not." I can I can marry as many black guys as you can. So both of them wound up marrying black guys. So they were uh, uh, they they were dis I always there's a joke I'd love to do. Uh, once you go black, you never go back. That's because they've been disowned by the family. There's nowhere for them to go back to. So uh, <laughs> you can't go back. It's no, we uh, a, a lot an of aunts and uncles just disowned them. Uh, you know the uh, Elaine and Lorraine are a couple of whores. You know they're Norwegian Danish background and oh, so they're super white. Yeah, and whiter so than liquid paper white. They, they were uh, the kind of white that Aryans aspire to be. Well, you know, because the, the Nordics, the, the the Nords, were you know had them beat. So. Well, the Nazis needed someone to aspire to as well. Well, then you got Abba. <laughs> one of the one of the one of the gals from Abba, she's a son, uh, she's a daughter of uh, of an SS trooper. Because back in Sweden, they are taking the the Swedish girls to. Uh, to uh, to breed with uh, with the officers with the that were uh, uh, with, with the Nazi officers that were there because they had the purest uh, look they could hope for. I had no idea that the Aryan race was so musical. Oh, well, you heard sounds the of music. The things you learn on Carla Collins <laughs> rocks the Elmo. <laughs> the things you learn. So this is I because I I'm fascinated. I knew nothing of this background. And uh, how old were you when your when your dad passed? I was nine, so just not quite ten. Jesus. So. So how did that affect your whole life? I didn't know you were that young. Um, well, I was lucky I had him for the nine years I had him, you know. But uh, when you start looking for new father figures, so where do you find him? Well, you know, I'd sit uh, in, back in those days. Um, you could go to the movie theater and pay a buck and sit there all day long until they closed or until my mother found out what theater I went to and came and yanked me. It's 11 o'clock, you silly ass. Don't you have the good sense to come home? Was, yeah, but I haven't seen this part again for the fourth time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, grew up, uh, you know, you start adopting the, the, the screen characters. So one time I went to a, uh, it was a four film Bogart film festival. So it was like Treasure Sierra de Madre, uh, uh, The Big Sleep, Key Largo, and Ooh. Maltese Falcon. Might have been Casa Blanca. Might have been five of them. But anyway, I saw each movie twice. So then I came out of there doing Bogart and Edward G. Robinson impressions. And of course, the kids at school is not enough to be a clown. You got to also do voices if you're going to really, you know, work that lunchroom. It's a tough room. Yeah, the lunch, people don't you know, know how tough. So the then I is. picked up W. C. Fields Film. Uh, Chicago had some great old uh, theaters where they had they called them festivals, but what they were was some guy could like get. You know, four reels of film for thirty-five dollars, and he played the same films all week long. And uh, you know, if, if the guy sitting next to you didn't touch you, it was a it was a good day at the theater. <laughs> That's uh, you know. <laughs> My mother always taught me sit on the aisle. Anytime you sit, if you're on a bus or a train, sit up front. And if you and you sit on an aisle seat, they can't touch you if you're on the aisle. I, I believe the Robinsons had that embroidered onto pillows, in fact. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were going to get it tattooed on the children. But. <laughs> that way you don't forget. No. So do you have siblings? Uh, I had a younger brother, but he, uh, he drank himself to death. He had, uh, I think his problem was uh, I was up in Winnipeg going to, going to high school, and my mom was still living in Chicago, and uh, um, he had to go to this uh, library after school from the hours that, uh, you know, before she could get off work to, you know, come grab him. 
And uh, she should have told him, don't use the bathroom at the library, because uh, some cat named May May apparently tried some uh, some terrible uh, behavior. This is really delightful and entertaining, isn't it? I, so, listen, anyway, well, Kenny, this is so I mean, utterly anyway, fascinating, um, and I you know uh, I don't think people know this about you. They we, uh, they need to. This is well, part of. I, it's what shaped and formed you, though. We always want to know where the comedy comes from, especially when you're as offensive as people say I am. Yeah, I you don't know, get that whatsoever. That, well, that was a beautiful thing. Uh, uh, last summer, not this past summer where nobody did anything, but the summer before, I did a gig at a resort, and I was told it was going to be like 16 and up, and I got there, and people got their 8-year-old kids in a room. That's so just I'm, mental breakdown time for me, i got to be honest. I'm walking, I'm walking on eggshells. I'm doing everything. I'm calling the girls up front, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, 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 Martha and Jan, and, uh, you know, Marsha and Jan, and that's not working, and then there's teenage boys, and I'm going, have you guys met any girls while you're here? And they go, no. And I go, these girls are probably hoping that you guys will get them some beer later. So then the parents start to get mad that <laughs> I'm suggesting these little, you know, 14-year-old girls may start floozing it up with the, the 17-year-old boys for alcohol. By the way, floozing it up is our, uh, <laughs> is our phrase today. So go well, ahead. Well, yeah, it's, it's much easier than the ones I could have thrown. And, <laughs> and then I started telling the kids not to do uh, edibles and then the ones that had tried to. So maybe some of the parents get it. So it got really ugly. And uh, uh, one of the moms threw a beer bottle at me. Wow. And uh, when the show is over, she goes, uh, I hope you're glad. You, I hope you're proud of yourself. You made an eight-year-old boy cry. And I said, what did I say? He goes, uh, I don't know. I was outside by that time. You were still up there being an asshole. So I'm thinking, you don't know what made you. So you, you left your child. <laughs> Weeping. <laughs> you were so upset by me. You, you ran for your own sanity and left your <laughs> child. Good thing I'm not a fire. You know, and... and <laughs> And then I, you know, saw I was like suicidal for about three or four days and, you know, driving back home. Well, I didn't get into comedy so I can make eight year old boys laugh. And then I thought about the shit that when I was eight years old, nine years old. I was going to say, does she I, even know? Like, bitch, this is nothing. Yeah. Like I learned how to spell from graffiti on bathroom walls. You know, uh, there was a, we used to be an old ice block ice machine that we used to have to pass on the way to school every day, grade one, grade two, and somebody had written on there, pussy is good. Now, I had no idea what pussy was, but I knew it was good. And every time Absolutely. we walked by it, mm -hmm. three, four, five of us, we all had, pussy is good. It was like the mantra we were being taught. <laughs> you were you know? did some early transcendental meditation. That's what it was, you know, and, and then I. Well, it's I, not wrong. No, like I said, it's not wrong. I, I didn't even know it. But, you know, then I learned how to spell it, fuck you. But the guy didn't have good uh, penmanship. So I was spelling it fuck you because I thought the U was an A. So, so you were just being black Irish. I was being, uh, <laughs> I, well, it was a neighborhood where the, the Irish would call us shines. So, uh, Jesus. <laughs> or when the jokes were speaking of, uh, speaking of black loafers, how was your father? That was one of the things that could lead oh. to a fight during lunch hour. Wow. When I was eight, so uh, so that's what was happening when you were eight. So yeah. she can just take her entitled. So little Rodney having a breakdown, <laughs> you know. And so then I started thinking about, well, shit. When you're seven, that guy tried to molest you and that other friend of yours when you guys were playing in the construction zone where you were told not to go, because uh, uh, the older kids had broke out some windows, so they were building townhouses. So you know, we threw a couple of rocks through the windows that were already broken. So this older guy came and said, uh, I'm going to tell the police, you both of you lean against the wall, uh, drop your pants, and then I uh, said, so one of y'all are going to have to be the pussy boy. And the other kid started crying, so I guess he knew what a pussy boy was. I didn't have any idea. You just so, knew it was good. Uh, I knew pussy was good, but I didn't know being a pussy boy was good. So I, so, uh, I looked over at him, and I, I raised the hand like to, to tell him to go first. And, uh, and I, I lived across the street from there, so I went, Oh, hey, there's my dad and his friend. So the guy goes, huh? Shut up. And he goes, don't let me see you guys here again. So he ran off. So, so you he, scared away the predator. Yeah, we squeaked. The yeah. molester is now. So the molester is running. So the next day, you know, this, this kid and I, we, we were back at school, and neither we look at each other, but we don't say anything. Right. And we couldn't tell our parents because we went where they told us not to go. And you were more terrified of the fury or wrath. Well, I had no idea what this guy parents, had intentions. Right. right. I still believed in Santa Claus, and uh, sometimes I said, why do I have to sit on the aisle seat, Mom? So I learned to stay away from construction sites. And, and look Santa's for the lap, aisle seat. I'm hoping. 
Oh well. Construction sites. See, you were, you're, you you know what every woman knows. So instinctively. I, and uh, and I learned these things um, at a young age to uh, so when you know so an eight year old child is is, is crying because of something I said. Uh, you know, I demand you apologize to my son. I'm thinking like, fuck your eight year olds, <laughs> you know. Because Kenny, so. if, you know what? Here's the other thing too. If people only knew the kind of person you are, the kind of heart you have, like this, that's your comedy, which is real. By the way, there ain't no Russell Peters without Kenny Robinson and your Nubian a comedy review. You are a mentor to everyone on the Canadian comedy scene, and that's very rare. You're crazy generous. You, you run very deep, and you have this movie of the week background that I'm just hearing of. I mean, I gotta tell you, I, I was impressed with you, Kenny, when you and I were doing a Sirius XM show, and you told a story about doctors discovered a new virial, venereal disease. They couldn't identify it oh, all. Oh, they you. named and I'm it like, after me. That's about as core as it gets. They <laughs> named it after you? No, I was saying they, <laughs> they didn't have a name. Oh, okay. So I said, they're gonna name it the Kennys. <laughs> you know, I said, damn. <laughs> Said herpes ain't got no cure. And my disease ain't even got a name. So I hope they don't name it after me. I'm sorry, my dear, but you have the Kennys. So, so but what I'm getting is you're still upset that you upset an eight year old. Uh, no. What I'm doing is uh, I'm, I'm using it to start working on a, on a one man show. Uh, I don't think the title "Fuck Your Eight Year Old" is the right title for it. Well, you better be careful of punctuation. You know, but. Uh, <laughs> No, maybe not. Maybe they, then they have to come to the show to see what I really mean. I may have a whole brand new market following me that I had no idea existed. Kardashian that shit up. Make you it know, as controversial as possible and they will come. Hey, yeah, either that or uh, I'll just have this show somewhere where we don't have a license and uh, we'll, we'll just do it and then just live off the, the, the uh, GoFundMe money. Who isn't? Yeah. So I think that's, uh, that's it's no, very pandemic that. of you. But what, do, now when you go on the stage, are you mm -hmm. no holds barred? Are you? Are we getting pure Kenny, or, or do you feel safe enough in any venue in Canada to well, really do it's the all full calculated. Robinson? It's it's all calculated, and over the years, I learned I can get away with some things, and and uh, like when I just tried to uh, when I just told you the story of. Uh, of the construction site, one time I started to do it at a Nubian show, and everybody, you know, right when the Me Too, uh, and I said, Me Too, what about what about me? And uh, and the audience was. You know, so I said, okay, maybe we need to do some more punchlines in this. So, maybe work up to it, you, you know, know. Give them your backstory. Yeah, not off the top. Okay, your first no. act, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, making his debut here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> please don't tell us any more of your stories. We but, all have jokes we can't open with until they get to know you and understand your perspective. Oh, and your... but sometimes I just can't wait to tell those jokes. Money shot, money shot, money shot. You know, it's... I know. Yeah, my, my, if, I, if, I, if I directed porn, it would start with the money shot. And, and then the next... I think, you, I think you're onto something. Why don't you just, uh, like, get your own porn hub? Just, just the stuff you want to see. We don't need a backstory. Yeah, we don't need people, a guy covered people in People have been disappointed enough in life. They don't they buy me in life. They don't need to pay money and get disappointed while sitting at home. So, but no, just start right away with a money shot and then uh, seven minutes of her crying and calling me every dirty name and trying to get dressed and me trying to apologize, me offering to drive her to the trade station. So, you know, that's, that could be the, the <laughs> Well, it's really more of a documentary, Kenny, but, uh, you know, I know Netflix is, is buying both. So, uh, so how did your upbringing, uh, the early death of your father, the interracial marriage, how did that affect how you in turn raised your children? Because you have two kids, I believe. Uh, three. And three. Three. I've got one from my first wife, uh, Kelly, and then I had two more from another woman named Kelly. Yes, you you were very much like Johnny Carson in that you just married women with the same name, and I know well, one of your wives. Well, that's because that period of time, it was uh, 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 Princess Grace. Uh, Grace Kelly was the big star, and everybody was naming their daughter Kelly. So then I started just dating younger women, and uh, right to Ashley or uh, Amber. I'm I'm getting a, a, a well, no Becky's, but uh, <laughs> Amber would be too young for me to deal with. But yes, yeah, so but there's just a, you know there's just this period of time, and uh, there were two Kellys before. Then some going what is so now I, I I vowed to myself that I don't care how hot she is if she's got you know if she owns a liquor store and, and is blind if her name is Kelly I'm not dancing. <laughs> I think you're missing an opportunity to never yell out the wrong name in bed. That's that, where I go. And I didn't have to change the towels. The initials were the same. <laughs> For 
Yeah, like, so, see, it's really kind of a win-win. The, the first really Kelly never that. got to use them. I said, we're saving them. She goes, saving them for what? They go, the next Kelly. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> now, did um, did one of the Kellys leave you for a woman? No, no, that's a, that that was uh, no, that was a misconception. She was always going to be that way. I was just the last dick stop on the subway. Gotcha. You that's know. such a <laughs> to lesbiana. Yes. Kenny Robinson, next lips, Dykeville, lips, hips, and fingertips, all aboard. So. <laughs> That's what you want to do. Once you go black, you never go back. In fact, you go right to chicks. Because there was nowhere. What guy was she going to do after you that would compare? Well, and plus, you know, like a lot of. You got to finish big. You know that from being a comedian. You got to close strong. If a that's a lot be your of guys like dick. doesn't didn't that crush you? And I went, no, I know she didn't leave me for anybody with a naturally bigger penis. <laughs> so you know that's where most men would have felt insecure. But I didn't have those. I envied her girl's thumb. That bitch had a thumb like Fred Flintstone hit it with a hand. But, you know, but I, I got over that soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> Get enough of this. I, I'm never wrapping this up, so I hope you're all comfortable because this is just, this is, this is the tip. Uh, before I let you go, I do want to say congratulations on the quarter century of the Thank you. Nubian Comedy Review. Now, I want to know what came first. Did you start that before Chocolate Sundays? And what's with black comedians and Sundays? Well, we are given Sundays because it's the slowest night of the week for the white club owners. <laughs> so it's like... I sort of walked into that, but I wanted to, just so you know. It's like, well, look, uh, you know, uh, Friday and Saturday takes care of itself, but what are you going to do with this Sunday? Well, the Sundays, the Schwarzes get all dressed up for church on Sunday. Maybe they want to come to the club after church. And they... they uh, I don't know if chocolate Sundays... In, in I the thought Nubians. it had something to do with church. I really did, because I've said that's my favorite show I've ever done. You've never had me on the Nubian night. I know I've asked, and you've and said... Then you, but you say I've never had you, and they say, okay, let's do it. And then you're back in L.A. for I another know. 11 months at a run. You know, which I would have seen if I could have switched you there, I would have left you the whole damn Nubian package. And you would have said, oh, I don't know these people. Who would I book? How do I pronounce these names? And I would have been in L.A. Uh, saying, finally. So um, Tonight on Wife Swap. That would be a really interesting episode. <laughs> Well, uh, and do you, do you think it's going to go for another 25? And why do you think well, it was such a magical... I mean, because it's by far the best night. Um, I, I think, like, I don't know if Chocolate Sundays happened first or if we happened first, but, I mean, um, it all happened because uh, the doors weren't being opened to comics of color. So there is Russell Simmons with Def Jam. Right. And, like, I was... Um, when I first saw Def Jam, I was in Chicago at the time. And Bernie Mac was working all the South Side and West Side clubs. And meanwhile, I was working Zanies and mm -hmm. uh, The Funny Firm and, and, uh, and uh, The Laugh Factory and never seen Bernie Mac in these mainstream rooms. And then because I was mainstream, I didn't have to go to uh, Cleo's Hair and Comedy. You know, I didn't have to go to some place on the west side where, you know, I, I may get knifed on the way in. Whereas that was just that, you know, that was that whole south side uh, Chitlin Circuit comedy scene. So because of the segregation and, and the natural uh, uh, forms of uh, how society is racially uh, uh, separated down in the States, it was a necessity. And, you know, and when I first saw Def Jam, I'm going like, whoa, because there was like D.L. Hewley and there was mm -hmm. and, and all the uh, Cedric and Bruce Bruce and all these the guys. The kings of comedy. Yeah, they all they all sprung from there. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, then I started doing this show. But these guys that were doing all the black comedy shows, they were used to getting kind of money a headliner in Canada could never dream of. Uh, you know, even the white guys that did the black clubs laughed at the money. They called me, I want to do your show. And I said, well, here's the money I can give you. Oh, I can't work for that little. And I said, well, shit, I do. So <laughs> Get on board. <laughs> you know, or so, don't do the show. So, you know, y'all stay. But uh, the one reason why the, the, the Nubian show was able to survive, because we had such a small talent uh, pool at first, was the comics from Detroit used to come up for it. Across the border. Yeah, yeah, back before you could, before 9-11. So they'd come up and, you know, I'd pay, in, like, uh, Kevin Hart, he cried all the way home after I paid him in money because I paid him in Canadian. And that was, like, when the dollar, the Canadian dollar was 60 cents on the, on the dollar. So after he exchanged his money, 
He said, I came all the way to Canada from Philadelphia for $71. You know, so, no gas. Well, uh, he's, it's okay, though. He, he's made up for it. I think oh, he's okay now. He, he, I think, you know how Scarlett O'Hara vowed she'd never be hungry again? <laughs> I think Kevin Hart held that Canadian money in his fist. <laughs> I will never work for this little again. Responsible <laughs> for Kevin Hart's career. <laughs> that one horribly paying Canadian that we, we came back and did the TV show I had on uh, uh, After Hours. Uh, right. And I believe that was his first time doing TV or definitely his first time doing sketch. And then uh, Leslie Jones had never done sketch before that show. It's so a, it, I don't think people listening realize how many careers you jump started or who or they're the first time they grew, raced a stage was because of you. Well, and I mean huge superstars. Yeah. And do they give you kickback now? No. Bastards. But, you know, I, I really couldn't ask for it. I, you know, the biggest question is... Uh, is uh, if you were so good, how come you weren't the bigger star? I went, Psh. you know, so, uh, you know, it, uh, I got no regrets. I don't harp, I, I, don't, uh, I don't warehouse no regrets, as uh, a friend of my mom's used to say. I always want to take, take something away with every show, been asking people what makes them laugh. You're the king, I'm not going there with you, but what, what brings you peace? Do you... Um I know this might sound a bit new agey for you, but again, because we have this bond, do you, do you talk to your mom since she's been gone? Uh, no, because I can still hear her in my head. So, uh... Can't get a word in? Well, she's, you know, she's telling me, you know, she's... I probably could, uh, I probably should have done more material about her when she was alive, you know, but... They're just the things that uh, she was not a hallmark mother Day kind of uh, mother. You know, like one time I was upset over this woman that I'd been out. When I was dating for about three, four years and we fell apart. And I was doing that, you know, self-destructive uh, listening to B.B. King and drinking it, you know, in the afternoon kind of shit that I used to roll around in. Mm -hmm. And now I just go, why are you an idiot to do that? But anyway, she said to me, she said, uh. How much money did you spend the first night uh, you brought her back to your place? And I said, well, I met her, uh, I met her in a bar, and I bought her a shot of Jack at, at, at last call, and then we came back to my place. And she goes, so you know what? That means anybody with five bucks in their pocket can fuck this girl that you're crying over. So I went, whoa! So then he gives you a whole different kind of... You're not of... going to see the star going, the more you know. <laughs> so... It wasn't June Cleaver. You know, so, uh, you know, when, when I have so many uh, of those moments but, like that oh, to, you gotta to pull bring out those in. To, but, but why not do a whole show? Well, you know, it's Mike honor. McDonald. After Mike McDonald saw the thing I wrote about my mother being sexually harassed and, and, and scooping the money, mm -hmm. he wanted to help me write a film about it. And, of course, then Mike's health deteriorated and he died. You know, he goes, this is a movie. And he had a whole different thing, you know, a whole different way of I, you know, looking it over. But then, you know, my aunt Lorraine was 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 a was a hell of a, a hell of a girl, and she helped raise me as well. And she had her own stories. And you know, both of them married uh, men that they were stronger than. So, um, you know, like my my aunt dated a friend of my dad's, who the great guy named Millard Frazier. He uh, he uh, he told his uh, one of his uh, he had like uh, thirteen kids, and each kid uh, looked just like him, but from different mothers. And uh, Mother's Day, he was the busiest man on the south side of Chicago. Mother's Day, he showed up flowers, <laughs> cash, clothes. He always had something falling off the back of a truck for everybody. <laughs> so um, he was dating my aunt for a while. Then my, he came in to visit my aunt. My aunt was, you know, was living in Chicago for a bit, and she was writing this guy back in Winnipeg. So Millard had uh, new clothes for her daughters that had just fallen off a truck and a fur coat. So uh, Millard, seeing that he's being played, and my aunt was a big-sized girl, he picked up my aunt by the elbows and banged her head on the ceiling. So, <laughs> you know, and then uh, he took the fur coat because when you're Millard Frazier, you always know a bitch that needs a fur coat. And uh, he <laughs> left the clothes for the girls because the babies didn't do me wrong, you did. So, and they still remained friends after that. But uh, Millard had this one ex-wife that had a, 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 husband, a boyfriend that was always abusing her. And he said, look, man, that's, uh, that's the mother of my children. You do it again, and uh, I'm going to kill you. And sure enough, he went and shot him. And then he went to this, uh, went to this lawyer that later on became a friend of the family. He just sat down in, in his office and said, I just killed a man. Now, how can we beat this? So... Um, 
Oh, and Millard was great. I mean, so let me just, uh, I'll tell one more story. Then <laughs> no, I'll let you get I'm, out of here. I'm not stopping this magic. But um, when we first moved to Chicago uh, for the long run, because we had bounced around a bit, um, we moved into this, uh, my mother and I went to get this house, the kind of deal for a house in a new neighborhood called Pill Hill in Chicago. It was called Pill Hill because most of the people living there were, were doctors. So anyway, because I was light-skinned and had a toque on, they had no idea that I was uh, a, a mixed child. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we moved in uh, about, I think it was about the 22nd of December or something like that, close to Christmas. Uh, they see that my dad is there and he's not just there to lift furniture. So right away they want us out. They want us out. So, uh, you know, they are driving around, flashing lights in our windows at night. And, um, you know, on Boxing Day, the, a brick was thrown through the window. So my dad called Millard. So New Year's Day, Millard comes over. And uh, first of all, he, uh, he puts speakers in the windows facing outside. And he's got like uh, James Brown's night train doo -doo -doo, blasting on New Year's Day. Uh, the Caucasians are hung over to begin with and very upset with their new uh, Then he brings about four or five of his kids and they're running all over everybody's lawn and they're throwing and they're throwing rocks and none of them had regular names. They all had names like Cookie and Buster and Butterball and, you know, all these nicknames. So he's like brought every ghetto nightmare child to the front of the neighborhood. And then Millard's barbecuing on the front lawn. New Year's Day with coals and he's cooking shit, right? So we know the neighbors are calling. You see what these black bastards are doing now. So um, yeah, the Karens are of the day are losing their minds. Oh, Karens had to be slapped and put to bed after taking a couple of Valium or something. They were losing it. So um, that night, um, my dad and Millard they had a bottle of whiskey and two pistols on the on the kitchen table, and my mother and I stayed at a at a motel that night. And uh, you know, I remember trying to look, so I see the guns, and Mills like, "Go away, boy! Ain't nothing on here, any of your business." And uh, so they're shooing me out, and you know, putting on the coat. And my mom, we're gonna stay in a hotel tonight. Is Dad coming? Maybe later. But uh, you know, Miller was saying, "Don't worry, if they don't come tonight, they ain't coming at all." And uh, they didn't come at all, but instead they offered us like you know a couple of grand more than the down payment that we'd put down on it. My mom said that's good because she didn't have January's mortgage, and uh, came you out know, ahead. And uh, and we moved, and now that entire neighborhood is black. <laughs> the snow isn't even white in that neighborhood anymore. It's uh, Jesse Jackson <laughs> lives there now, but uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I I know a mic drop when I hear one, and um, I, I I adore you. I mean, you've lived Likewise. a motherfucking life. It's, I don't even, I feel like I've just watched like five of Tarantino's movies in succession. I didn't use the N-word. <laughs> that, that's, if uh, you'd like to, no, I, uh, no. <laughs> that's on you. I, I do, I, I, I just want to say on behalf of every comic, um, thank you. Thank uh, you. For being you, thank you for your guidance and your support. And uh, as I said, it's when Kenny retweets you or would you quote me on Facebook? It is, it is literally being touched by the hand well, of the Godfather. I would like to say if, there was, if everything was fair in this world, um, you would be a, a, a star across the screen. Um, you know, um, I, if they ever wanted to make a TV series with the housewives, you would have been the one that would have stole them all away. You know, I think sometimes your wonderful sense of humor gets, uh, I think your, your glamor and, 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 and beauty uh, sometimes uh, blocks out your true comedic abilities. So uh, as I see you as somebody with all the tools, and like I said, in a, in a, in a, in a fair and just world, um, you know, you'd have, been, uh, you'd have been married with children. You'd, you'd have had all that, uh, you know, all the, and who's not to say it still isn't? You know, but because uh, maybe cause, one child. Well, maybe no, I don't mean might be able just to eke out the one at this no, stage. I, sure. No, I mean the TV show. Yes, Remember the, of course. Okay. Well, what do you think this is? Think, yes. I, I, you know, I've been, we've been joking that I'm making everybody on this show cry, but uh, you have me completely overwhelmed right now. Well, now I'm going to go make my kids cry. <laughs> There's no Christmas. But it is a theme. Curb. <laughs> I the call one. it curb because without it, that's where I'd be living. I'm not getting a Serb check. <laughs> Serb check. That just sounds like a. 
like ethnic cleansing. So I'm careful with these words. But <laughs> <laughs> will you come back? Absolutely. Good, because I I have you on here anytime you want to. And I'll make up some more fibs. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm never bogged down by facts, <laughs> as you know. I love you. I wish they all wasn't the truth, but love you too. Thank you. And you know what? I'm no Mike McDonald, but someone's got to co-write this with you because these stories need to find a life outside just this broadcast too. Well, I wish I'd remember the details to, to, to protect the innocent, but we'll get it done. I think that's my new project. Well, that'll do it. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Kenny Robinson, I don't need to say anything more. I should have wore a tie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so from the godfather to the goddaughter, I asked Kenny, um, maybe you could tell me some of the people that you've mentored, and he gave me a long scroll, a list of names, and I thought, Keisha Brownie, I pick her, because uh, I know Keisha, I love her, you're going to love her, she is a comedian, a host, a rap star, a producer, an actor, she does it all. She's on Carla Collins Rocks the Elmo. I wish you could be at the Elmo. I wish we both could be doll, uh, like I was with Kenny. But mm -hmm. Keisha, we're here remotely during the plague and the shutdown. We're doing what we can. You look gorgeous. You look like a you million bucks in Thank you, Carla. <laughs> Carla, you guys, Carla, first of all, thank you very much for having me on your platform here. For all our viewers, you guys must know that Carla Collins is aging like a fine black woman, I must say. <laughs> You look good, girl. Okay? Thank I don't you. know what you eat. I don't know what you do, but you look great. As you know, I think I am a fine black girl. I uh, see. In, yes. That's, they don't know, but like, yeah, you just have a lighter tone. I, I really do because my brother and I, I'm just saying, I think the features, are, I haven't done my 23 in me. I don't know what's going on. I like to keep it mysterious. There you go. <laughs> I don't need to know all the ingredients in this cocktail. I just gotta keep drinking it, right? There you, you just keep drinking, man. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. That just totally made my day. Keisha, we haven't seen each other, we were saying like five, six years now. Yeah. Are you like yeah. me with time? I'm like, was that four months ago or 10 years ago? I know, every day is Saturday now, especially with this pandemic, right? The days are just meshing together. But yeah, I think it's been like five years, yeah. Uh, way too long. I'm a giant fan of yours, as you know. I love you. You make me laugh all the time. And uh, so just to, to be slightly professional on this podcast slash web series. Right. So it was just chatting with Kenny. And congratulations, because I do want to mention the album again, the Kenny yeah. Robinson Review, Nubian Disciples, the next 25 years. Tell me how you got involved with that, doll. Let's start with that. Oh, my goodness. Well, uh, first and foremost, big shout out to Kenny Robinson. I mean, over the years, yes, he's been a mentor, but more than ever, he's like a big father figure for a whole bunch of people, including yourself, mm -hmm. Carla. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he compiled, a, you know, a group of the best of the best. And I, I'm very happy to be like, I think there's two females on it, myself and Tamara Siobhan. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he compiled a group of us. I think there's about... That was a great show. It was like maybe 20 over 15 comics. It was crazy. It was tight, wow. but we were like, you know, Kenny, stick to the point, make a joke, kid, get off, you know? <laughs> so um, I'm really appreciative to that because Kenny didn't even put himself on the album. You know what I'm saying? So um, why is that guy? He's such a superstar. He's, I, he I adore him as, as you, everybody's just heard. I mean, it's just a love fest when it comes to Kenny. It's always yeah. an honor to share the stage with him. And Keisha, I don't know if you're like me, when Kenny retweets me or takes something I've said on Facebook yeah, and then mentions me, it's you've been blessed by the Godfather. I'm happy for a month. It's true. It's true. And um, he's really he's really paved a way for, uh, you know, a lot of people who look, my, look like myself. And he's made a home for us that, you know, we were able to go to every month and practice our stuff. So... Like if it wasn't for his show and, you know, that kind of community, I wouldn't really, you know, be getting my feet wet as much as I did. So I was happy to be on that. He got it published 2020. I think it was out in September mm -hmm. on all social media platforms. It's just a great compilation of great comics. A lot of people, you know, too. Absolutely. John Paul. I love, I mean, I love it. I, I think you know, I'm always getting, 
I just asked him just in during our interview, when are you putting me up? And he's, he has two ads. He's like, well, you're never in town. And the other one, he says, there's going to be a lot of black women doing this. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I don't, don't care. Man. I'm fearless. I'm going to go up there yeah. and make you're fun gonna, of one. <laughs> you, yeah. You, you, of the you like up. Yeah. You got to make your way down there, Carla. They love you. Love well, it. I was watching some of your um, shows and uh, two things I want to bring up with you had two backup dancers. I think it was old school, but you said it still slaps hard and it does. And it's the who won the world? And you're like, white people. Who run the world? White people. White people. <laughs> it was great. It was, you see, the thing is, I always love, I, and I still want to be. Singing was always my first kind of love. And I noticed with the whole stand up comedy thing, is I started making weird little jingles in my head. and call them parodies so yeah I did get backup dancers that's something I've never seen <laughs> and it was I, live and it was hurt. fantastic it really and it did it hit it worked it, it, it worked crushed. right the other um the other um, bit of yours I was watching which reminded me a bit of mine because you know I'm out in the wild again you know me always going through husbands it's like I discard them like at a mommy shows okay there's another husband gone so <laughs> But, you know, because I was like married for 10 years, I, I go out and, and the pickup lines, you have this great bit about caravan pickup lines. And it's yeah. so true. Yeah. Right. Because you, so, so, and you're like obviously in the 90s, a little bit classier, a little more subtle, right? Guys hitting right. on you. And right. So, what did that sound like in the 90s? A guy coming up to a fine woman like yourself. You know, I mean, you know, uh, guys in the 90s, they were smooth. They're like, you know, hey, shorty looking beautiful today you know can I get your number and it doesn't matter how tall you were everyone was shorty do you remember like back yeah. then we were all shorties I blame TLC I don't know if that's the scrums yeah. and shorties and um and of course 50 50 cent right yeah it was your yeah. birthday go shorty again for shorty was... see it's like what if we're six feet three that doesn't make sense <laughs> please. please that's debatable Exactly. But, you know, you go with it because it was smooth. It was like an R&B band from the 90s, right? Remember yeah. all the boy bands? And they're like, hey, how you doing, girl? And it was the same thing for me. It was just like, listen, and it was sweet. And now. Girl, now it's like, sorry, I have a boyfriend. They're like, I don't care. You need a man. Like, it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, hey, wait a minute. Are we allowed yeah. to have more than one husband? I don't know. <laughs> Well, in Utah, sure. Sure. Uh, but I know you're like, what was your line like? A guy coming to you, hey, is your vagina ball? Hello. Yes. yes, I did say that. I didn't I didn't think that was PG enough, but there, you said it, Carly. Yeah. Oh, honey, this. this show is, this is, listen, for once, I'm not on network TV. It's not radio. I don't have an executive up my ass. Okay. Uh, so. so, no, we could say anything on this. It's just the nice Nice. Thing. Good yes. stuff. It's a good form for the comedians or just to be just to be real because that's how people talk. Right. I, I noticed that too. And it's actually one of Kenny's <laughs> favorite. This is the one he retweeted of mine. It's like, and it also he'll just do the punchline. So there's no context. But <laughs> I was I was talking about how I love the millennials. I mean, I'm a Gen Xer, but I love the millennials. You know, because they're not racist and they're gender, you know, they're gender fluid, yeah. they care about the environment. Those are just our birds. And I said, but when it comes to sexuality, they're just like right for the money shop because if they're, you know, if they're always watching free porn, so they're like, hey, shit yeah. or get off my chest. I'm like, what? Right. So it's just boom. There's no finessing. There's none. It's it's hot or cold. I can't, yeah, that's I mean, shit, that's a thing now, right? It's like, are you sure it's gonna smell? I did a lot of stuff happen that I just didn't know about. I have like sex FOMO. I, I don't know what's going on. I'm obviously very square because some of the kids I'm just like, yeah, I, I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, I don't know if it comes with age, but I find myself getting more prude and prude as the, as the <laughs> years. I'm like, oh my gosh, my elbow is showing. I need to cover this up. <laughs> very <laughs> like, Amish. Oh, oh, is that a risk? <laughs> So what's your status yeah, right yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you have a dude? I'm oh, I'm single. I just got out of something mm -hmm. in 2020. I've been trying to get out of that since 2017. But, you know, 
Yeah. So sometimes the pandemic, it's you're like, go. yeah, you're like, okay, I can't, I can't be isolating with you anymore. Bye bye. Yeah. Exactly. So how exactly. have you been? I mean, you it always uh, relationship. On Insta, whenever I see, I mean, you always right? seem up. You're always like, like, how have you been surviving this whole shutdown pandemic? I know that you produce. It's another thing that I think you know. Kenny produces the movie, but you've produced a couple short uh, shows already. A couple um, shows, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like Comics Corner, was it? Your your uh, Joker's show? Corner. Joker's Corner. Joker's Corner. Yeah. And then now you have um, Stand Up Stitches, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh, I mean, for the most part, when this first pandemic hit, I, w- I was just like everyone else. I was scared. I was worried. I ate. I drank. I, you know, there was one month I went like every day I was in the Bible. I was like, OK, this is it. We're in Exodus, guys. We <laughs> have your threesomes now because he's coming. Like, let's go. It's How many more plagues do we have? I don't. <laughs> right. So, I mean, for the most part, a lot of that, a lot of uh, a lot of decluttering. Carla, a lot of going oh. through all my journals, yeah, all my joke books. It's a, uh, it's been a, yeah, it's a good unpacking, just making room for more abundance, really. And I've been, um, so Jean Paul, uh, he compiled a group of friends, and we all had a video chat one night. And mm-hmm. then that video chat, because he just wanted to check in on the people he cared about, right? That video chat ended up being a weekly comedy show called the Minority Report. We had Kenny on a second. Saw it. Yes, I saw the Minority Report. It was like a, a POV for POCs, right? There you go. That was his slogan. Absolutely. And I tell you, Carla, if it was not for that show, I don't know what I'd do. That kept me sane. We had meetings twice a week. We did this every Sunday. Um, we implemented sketches and character. It just evolved and it was what it was. We took a break in the summer mm-hmm. and now we're back. So I'm really grateful for that show because, I mean, I have so much more new material. You you mentioned the stuff on, I don't even put anything on YouTube as much as I should. Yeah. Because we don't have joke insurance. It's what I try to tell everyone. I'm like, "Mm, I don't know. I'm getting it all the time. They're like, you need more stuff. You need content. I'm like, I have lots, but I don't have joke insurance. You know, we don't want to go popping people (laughs) because we're just. That's a different kind of show, okay? Exactly. So that's a whole other thing. That's, that's a whole right. other thing. But so that's it's wonderful right. that so this like like a family, you guys came together together every week and kept each other. Yeah, somewhat you know, safe. It was, and you know, it keeps you on your feet because because it's a weekly. You have to keep creating. You have to keep watching the news. It's and I don't know about you, Carla. I'm a very lazy writer. I if it wasn't for the show, I'd probably write two jokes last year like (laughs) so I'm really that's what kept me sane and then other things started to roll through I worked with the city of Brampton at the Rose Theater and produced my own show there which was pretty stellar I'm proud about that one for sure and that show you guys are streaming right so once we can actually leave our homes you can I'm sure that will start back up again absolutely so it's broadcasted live but yes it's yeah yeah that's wonderful so you did the whole Marie Kondo thing but with jokes you cleaned out because I I always I so subscribe to that that you've got to create a vacuum you've got to have some room in the trunk for new goodness to come in it's true and I find so often I told people I really had a hard time in the beginning of the pandemic because we're always I'm always used to go 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 I think I function better that way. Mm-hmm. All this downtime, I was like, I I have to deal with my feelings. I have to deal with my thoughts. I have to, you know, I a lot of emotional unpacking has been happening the whole of 2020. I'm sure for everyone too. You know, it's it's been a rough year. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really has. And it's, you know, it's one thing, but you, you seem to be getting something out of it. It is tough when you first, because I'm like you always busy. That's how yep. I stay out of jail. That's my joke. And then it's just you and your demons. You've got to wrestle your dream demons. So I yep. like to pretend they're WWE demons. They're just fake wrestling. They're in singlets and high boots and big belts. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the humor's 
humorous kept it going or doing Facebook lives or I was also streaming uh, from a theater in Los Angeles, uh, the White Fire Theater. So, you know, because it's like we need comedy more than ever, but the irony is we can't, we can't yeah. really do our craft. Yeah, it's, uh, I tell everyone, if you had a podcast before the pandemic, you're, you're in a good zone because that's what it, well, besides the whole screen in front of your face, we're just essentially, it's a podcast. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, listen, I mean, it's so funny when I started this a couple months ago, I'm like, that's right. Masks and podcasts are mandatory. Let me jump on this bandwagon. Absolutely. And, and you're doing so good. I'm, I'm trying to do a thing where it's like uh, you know, we've had um, great little mini concerts from Gowan and Gordon Depp from The Spoons. And then we'll have a couple of comedians on, or, you know, we had Dean McDermott. I had like a bad boys episode nice. with Michael Weckerly. So we're just, yeah, just uh, an opportunity to talk to everybody who I love and, and keep it all going, you know, in this virtual world. Which yeah, is, that's, that's great. It's good. We it's not even it. me. It's, I look good because this is my avatar. It's not even me oh talking God. to you. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> this is my avatar. This is just a filter quiche. We're good. Oh my gosh, Carla, you're I'm gonna get you on stand-up stitches. I know I my thoughts go a million miles per hour, but it's just logging in that I'm like, oh man, she's in Toronto. Amazing. Amazing. I yeah. would love to do it anytime. I'd love to play the Rose Theater. Somebody, Kevin Pennant asked, actually hit me up like just at the beginning of this, end of February, beginning of March, and said, Hey, you want to play the Rose Theater? And then, of course, a boom. So, oh, man. No. so this will, yeah, complete the complete this. So, I love where you're going with the whole unpacking. And I, I haven't ever heard anyone say that they decluttered their jokes. <laughs> Just punch lines. Um, what else have you? Is there any other uh, advice for people watching, or any other girls? Uh, or nuggets of wisdom you can offer up that's really helped you through this and will continue to help us through this? I think it's really important to get a morning routine down pat. Mm -hmm. I think it really affects your day. What I've been doing now is I try my best not to go on social media until after 11 or 12 because it does something mentally to you. If you wake up and you grab that phone first thing, you're like, oh, look at this skinny bitch. Who am I, you know? And then, <laughs> you know, your whole day is gonna be, you know, those little opinions, which you really don't need. So I recommend, I've seemed to kind of, like I kind of have a routine. I wake up, do my affirmations, do my prayer. I read and I journal. And then the rest is, it goes smooth from there. Also you got to walk, you got to work out. Uh, even though gyms are closed, I try to walk every day for 30 minutes, at least, you know, because I think it does something like it gets your brain going, the juices going. If, if you just like, ugh. I could be a log, but I don't want to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, I swear by it. I, I will, or I will come bitch. I, I'm not good. If I haven't worked out for a while. The other day I was trying, there's a, a little trampoline here. And I'm like, this is so good. It's good for the lymph nodes. And, you know, it's good. And I thought, yeah. I also feel like I'm in the opening credits of the man show. Do you remember that? Like just Adam yeah. Carolla and Jimmy Kimmel. I'm like, there's also something creepy about this, but I'm by myself, so it's cool. <laughs> You're by yourself. It's good. Yeah, it's good. we can do, all, again, no pants. We don't have to. I mean, it's like, I literally ask people, okay, on this, is it a Zoom call or is it just audio? Because I need to know whether I need to, to wash my hair. Otherwise- right? It's kind of nice that it's, way. Uh, Carla, I love it. I, <laughs> I know. I love it. I love, <laughs> listen, girl, I got every pair of jogging pants you could think of. Please, <laughs> uh, chic, uh, casual. We are ready for the second lockdown. It's good. Oh, yeah, love now, it. Yes, now we have it down to an art. Like at first it was, oh, I don't know what this is, what to do. I'm like, oh, yeah, bring it on now. This bitch totally knows how to handle it. Yeah. Making my own bow tie right? from That's scratch, just using some almond milk. Seriously, you know, like I've got this handled now. Because <laughs> I finally, Seriously. our you know, only stress. Yeah, I. I but I go, love. Go ahead, I love. I love the morning routine that you speak of because then you, you know, it sets 
the tone for your day. You've already done something. Because if not, it's just me lying on the couch, like, you yeah. know, in my pajamas, masturbating to a Murdoch Mysteries marathon. Like, you know, I, if I don't start it off properly, it's a slippery slope. Yeah. It's like, it goes it's down real fast. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also a daily routine. You got to rub one out because girl, I mean, Obviously. why not? <laughs> that's all we have, right? It's, it's super safe. I even wear a mask when I do that. You can't be too sure. I don't know where I've been. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. I love it. I love it. You got to wear so, a mask. Now. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about was, which I didn't know, so I was doing some deeper dive and research is all of a sudden this video pops up that we're going to play called oh. Rip Bottom Nail. And right, I'm girl. like, is Keisha a rap star that I didn't know? And, and you're legit. Like you have a beautiful voice. This isn't just a parody. This is yeah. this like musical was, talent. This was, uh, yeah, it was very original. It, uh, it came from boredom. Actually, I was in the car with my boyfriend and I just really decided to paint underneath my acrylic nails red. I had that color I had at the time. And I just kept repeating red bottom nails, red <laughs> bottom nails. And we're like, you know what? This sounds like a catchy shot song. And at the time, all the millennials were into that stupid trap shit that I actually don't like. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm hopping on this board. Oh my God. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's a, and, you know what, Carla, I really respect musicians because there's so much they got to do. They got to record it. They got to master it. They got to produce it where it's just comedy is just comedy. That's it. We go up, we perform, we're done. But what I've noticed with music is it can probably take you further. Like I could have, that song could be playing in Japan for all I know. And here I am sitting in Brampton. So I mean, it's something that I'm going to probably look into a lot more. I actually made a Christmas song, too, with a couple other rappers. Really? I'll, send it to you. I I'll did. do it. And, what, and what's that called? It's called uh, We Three Queens. You know, the story <laughs> of the three kings, but this of is course. queen. Yeah. Absolutely. Who would have been way better at bringing gifts? It wouldn't be Murr or whatever the hell yeah. that was. Oh, and that's what I rapped about. That was so what? Tough. <laughs> yeah, that was tough. It was fun. Yeah. We know what to shop for. So um, I do want to ask you this before I go. This is like an almost, it's, it, it's like the opposite effect here. I wanted to ask you about your origin story because uh, Kenny and I spoke of his earlier. And mm -hmm. I got to tell you, no pressure, but his were like car chases and embezzlement, a murder to prison. So feel free to not be bogged down my facts when you tell me yours, but uh, I know you were born in Montreal. Yes. Um, and I know you're very, you're, you were very close with your parents. So tell us, tell us your origin story, you little superhero. So my origin story, yes. Born in Montreal, my parents are Jamaican. <clears throat> I don't know why they moved there. Um, maybe they thought- <laughs> Odd <I was> choice. <laughs> And uh, so I'm the last of three. I'm the I'm the baby. And um, growing up, I heard okay, I heard all the crazy stories like you just mentioned, because I I kind of missed all of that. Um, me and my siblings, I think we're like we're like 12, 10 years apart. So oh wow, yeah. So I'm like, was I a mistake? Um, <laughs> Uh, that's why I tell people, don't have one child, they're going to be a comic. Um, <laughs> so I just grew grew up here. Yeah, is that right? In English? Okay, yeah. I grew up hearing all the crazy stories um, from my mom and dad in Montreal. Like, my dad was a janitor, and uh, it was, it's, it's crazy. Uh, he had a cutlass, they were DJs, they danced, it's, wow. and then um, on my, on my dad's side, it's a lot of, a lot of white Jamaicans, Carla. So I don't talk about this too much and I'm thinking about writing a tell all, but when I mean, you, you look like my cousin right now, you look like my cousin, Melissa, no word of a lie. So I grew up very confused. There's a lot of white people in my family with freckles and they're like, Keisha, how is everything? So just <laughs> hearing that, just hearing that, that's I'm like, oh my gosh, is she cold? Like, <laughs> 
it, it, it's a bit shocking. It's a bit shocking. Um, I remember a lot of parties uh, growing up every weekend because um, my, my dad's family is huge. They had like, he had 12 siblings, eight alive. I know. Wow, my that's grandmother like my, that's like no my kid. mom. French Canadian mother. Yeah, yeah. I got you. Yeah, they had so many children. So all my aunts and uncles would come over every weekend. These guys love their liquor and all they would do is dance. Like I come from a family of dancers. Oh. That's all they did. So, I mean, for the most part, you know, I hung around a lot of my friends because, the uh, you know, my siblings are all grown up. I don't know. And uh, yeah, I heard a lot of really crazy stories growing up about my parents. I don't I mean, I don't want to. I mean, they were cool. They were cool people. Sound like cool people. Well, I know you'd mention them in your routines, and yeah. um, and I know, and I'm very sorry that your father passed away. I, uh, I think it's two years now, right? Two years, yeah. Two years today. It's uh oh my goodness. Well, yeah. how how auspicious that we're uh, we're doing this show for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Send a yeah. love to Keisha's dad. So yeah. have you had like? Because I. I talk about this a lot on the show that I'm still waiting for a message from my mom. And they're like, mostly I just want a glass of Pinot Grigio to pour itself. Then I'll know it's her. Uh, do, do you feel your dad around you? Do you uh, dream about him? Anything like that? I, you know what? Sometimes I do like certain songs that'll play on the radio when I'm sobbing and thinking of him. I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> Dennis Brown. What the heck is, you know, Gregory Isaac. This is, this is so random. So I think actually one time at the airport, I was at the airport and they were playing, uh, Jesus, what's this guy's name? Desmond Decker. He has a song. Oh, the Israel, wake up in the morning. Da, da. I'm like, at Pearson Airport, Dad? Really? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, so sometimes, you know, it comes and it goes, you know, and same with the emotions. You're up, you're down. It's Every day is unpredictable, but it does. Uh, yeah, grief is all over the map, and it kneecaps you when you least expect it. But then I think I guess we're lucky because the opposite of that would be, you know, not feeling at all. So yeah, it's true. Rather, rather pick that double-edged sword. And big shout outs to Kenny. Kenny actually came to the funeral. He was at the viewing. Um, oh. I know I love this guy, and he was like, "Brownie, I didn't know he had so much." white people in your family i'm like <laughs> they all look like you kenny what do you mean <laughs> it's but uh, uh on his album i do have one of my favorite jokes that i do about my dad so that makes the album that much more special because you know they live on through us right carla like oh, you know absolutely. your mother lives on through you and you know so can you uh this is where we're, we're, we're can that be our closer can you give us your dad's joke to close out this interview, Dom? Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, also buy the album, guys. Um, Absolutely. So, you know, right? So, uh, yeah, so the joke goes, um, so my dad was just recently diagnosed with his fourth stroke. I know, he's immortal. Um, he's also really stubborn because, you know, when the doctor tried to diagnose him, he wasn't trying to hear it. The doctor comes in and he looks at my dad. He's like, sir, we're going to have to take some blood. And I swear to you, my dad turns around. He's like, are you a name Dracula? I was like, oh, <laughs> that's hilarious, dad. What the hell? I'm not going to drink it. <laughs> you know? I'm like, hold on. Let me write that down. Oh, I and love it. The doctor. Right. He, he takes the stuff. He comes back in with the results and he looks at my dad and he says to him, sir, it seems as though you were diagnosed with your fourth stroke. And I swear to you, Carla, my dad turns around, looks the doctor right in the face, and he's like, me don't get strokes. Me give strokes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, yeah. Comedy is honesty. That's, that's what it is. It really, all the best comedy comes from an honest place. And like, that is where I'm a very lazy writer, because I just take whatever's happened and tell it on stage like you just did. What an honor. Wow. Sounds wonderful. I love this. This yeah. we'll dedicate this whole show. What's your dad's name? Norman Brownie. Norman Brownie. This one's for you. I love it. I love it. 
So thank you so much for being on the show. And you're talking about your two dads, Kenny Robinson, Norman Brownie. And I, I know you've given us beautiful moments, laughter, but I'm coming away from this with Jamaican Karens. How are you doing, my everything Irie? Just a bunch of bitches looking like me oh, with that accent. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Where can we find you, honey? Where can we find you? People want more of Keisha. Okay, guys. Well, I'm on all the social media platforms, the Instagrams, Twitter, Facebook. Everything is Keisha Brownie. That's spelled with two E's. Brownie like the dessert. And you could also catch me on my website, which I will be updating at gotbrownie.com. <laughs> that's Perfect. about it. Yeah. All right. Well, and we're going to play out. We're going to play this show out with uh, Red Bottom Nail, too. That's this right. So this is so your, exciting. Thank you. Your Carla. rapper name. Do you have a rapper name? I went by Ms. Brownie. I was I'm like, I'm not a real rapper. They're so angry, Carla. It, they're so angry. Rappers are upset. So I've. <laughs> Maybe by the third, by the third lockdown, you'll be that angry. You'll have that same rage. <laughs> You're right. You're right. You are correct. That's it. <laughs> oh man. I love you. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you, girl. Oh, love you and take good care. Okay. You too. Right. We'll talk soon. Bye, gorgeous. Bye. Amazing. Want to thank my guest today, the man, the mirth, the legend, the godfather of Canadian comedy, Mr. Kenny Robinson, and oh, one of his many goddaughters, host, comedian, actress, producer, rap star, Keisha Brownie. Please do yourself a favor and get that album. They are not fooling around. It is so good. Kenny Robinson's Nubian Comedy Review, The Next 25. And uh, I thought I would leave you with a couple of the beautiful quotations from Maya Angelou. She has thousands, but these ones struck me today. People won't remember what you said. People won't remember what you did, but they will always remember how you made them feel. So thank you, Kenny and Keisha, for making me feel like a million bucks American. Also, if you don't like it, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. Kind of fitting for our crazy days. And finally, nothing works unless you do work. If you hear purring, it's Oreo. All right. Well, thanks so much for watching. Carla Collins rocks the Alma on behalf of all the critters here at the Funny Farm and producer and set constructor extraordinaire, Michael Stewart Webb. Thanks for watching. If you are watching on YouTube, please subscribe. Leave us a comment. Leave us a, a like or a thumbs up, whatever. If you're just listening, keep being you. And uh, we'll see you next week. We're going to leave you with Red Bottom Nail. Here she is, Ms. Brownie. Enjoy. Shout out my boy, Kevy Kev. It's your girl, Keisha Brownie. Miss Brownie in the studio. And this one's going out for the gal then. You see it. Cheer. Red Bottom Nail. Red bottom nails. I'm 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 cute and sexy with my with my with my with my, with my, with my red bottom nails. Red bottom nails. I'm 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 cute and sexy with my with 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 with, 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 with my phone ring and I'm home singing in bed on my tail. One dread wanted veil since my red bottom hails from T. King and we known for bringing that red white and fail. Yeah, grip for real, grip grip the wheel with red bottom nails. Red bottom nails. Red bottom nails. I'm 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 cute and sexy with my red bottom nails. With my red bottom nails. Red bottom nails. I'm 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 cute and sexy with my red bottom nails. Sweet martinis between these red bottom nails. So we set on a sailboat. Blue boots and wavy. Boatload of crazy. Boat smoke by ladies. Smashing fashion, cashing in my red bottom nails. We'll spread sonic scales. How it looks when I grip bread, chronic males. Chill, chill. Uh, I don't think you heard me. I said money, weed, guys. I'm cute and sexy with my red bottom nails. Red bottom nails. Red bottom nails. I'm, I'm, I'm cute and sexy with my, with my, with my, with my, with my red bottom nails. Red bottom nails. I'm, I'm, I'm cute and sexy with my, 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 with my Red, red bottom, bottom nails I'm cute and sexy with my red bottom nails